Midway through the Moroccan spring of 1989, Adil Tarabt was born in Fez, but raised in a comparatively quieter seaside town in the south of France. Soon, local hype was generated around him. When R.C. Lens opened their academy doors to the teenager, Adele's far-fetched pipe dream became a reality. From the age of 14, he played a handful of matches for their B-side and by 17 debuted for the first team to kick off his Ligue 1 career. It turned out to be a one-and-done situation for the Moroccan, as scouting agents from across the channel had clocked that this was a teen sensation and were prepped to place their bets. Before even making a second appearance in Lens, Premier League negotiations had advanced, with Arsenal at the front of the line. Persuaded by former scout for the Gunners Damien Camoli, who had controversially taken the director of football role across North London two years prior, Tarabt joins forces with Tottenham Hotspur. Still months away from his 18th birthday, expectations towered over the lone E, who is tagged as one of the best talents in Europe for his age. And here is Adel Tarabt with his Tottenham debut, a 17 year old French starlet on loan from Laws. And even with only half an hour of BPL game time under his belt, Spurs made it permanent in the summer of 2007. Whenever given the chance, Adil's magic was clear to see, but remained an irregular sub under the struggling Martin Yol, who lost his job to Juan de Ramos that October. Unable to salvage Yol's mess, the strict Spaniard took some severe measures to reinvigorate the squad, lumping the Moroccan in with a small group of slackers who Ramos deemed superfluous, not bothering to give them squad numbers and offloading them to youth training until they found clubs. In no time, and without justification, the wide-eyed youngster had gone from the promise of involvement in a youth-focused project to complete exclusion. He got a taste of the business, and it was bitter. Forced to take a step down, Adil hadn't settled at White Hart Lane, but did so in London, so of all the options, it was Queen's Park Rangers which appealed to him most. Now in the championship, he wasn't dispirited as much as he was propelled by Tottenham's treatment, setting out on a vindictive quest in the capital's west. Now also a Moroccan international, his start at Loftus Road was impressive, tucking away a winner to steal the points from Bristol City in only his third match for QPR. Still deemed unnecessary by Spurs, they sent him back for another year, during which he would firmly stamp his mark. Claiming the hoops a first win of the campaign, his upper echelon talents became truly apparent several weeks later. Hosting Preston, he chested down and controlled a keeper's kick before charging towards goal, shrugging off anyone near him and not making the last man before side-footing it over the goalie. Named the league's goal of the month, this was his breakthrough moment, and across the remaining weeks, he backed it up with some more eye-catching performances. Showcasing his playmaking acumen as the front-footed midfielder, not only was he forging plenty of chances every week, but tallied up a notable seven goals with all sorts of finishes. The 20-year-old had quickly burst into life, becoming the latest infatuation of a fan base with little to cheer about. QPR was in disorder. Four different managers had taken charge in 0910, and there'd even been a chairman's switch, all contributing factors to the club's 13th place finish. Included in the team of the season, and suddenly earning the praise he knew was deserved, Tarapt couldn't drown out his own buzz. A single solid season of second-tier football wasn't enough to account for the opinions he shared in an interview that March, voicing his dislike of the English playing style and that he knows a move to one of the Spanish giants is in his future. The confidence he'd played with mutated to arrogance off the pitch, and when no summer bids came his way, the Moroccan agreed a three-year deal to stay at Loftus Road. One million pounds was all it cost Neil Warnock to make a deal a full-time ranger, and again fueled by the feeling of rejection, he embarked on a magical campaign. 
The Sheffielder, knowing in full both his supreme ability and wild temperament, opted to take a risk and trust him from the off. This guy, Sunny Day, got gloves on. I said, who's that? He said, that's Terav Berger. You, you don't want to know about him. He'll get you the sack. I made him captain. We'll get another 20%, 25% if he's captain. A decision that was instantly rewarded. From the number 10 position, he was not just unplayable, but incomparable, except maybe to the likes of JJ Akocha or even Zidane, as the best kind of showboater, entertaining and effective. No different to a school ground one kid show, Tarapt was soaking up the spotlight every week with streamers from range to skill runs that could send defenders to an early grave. As a stocky but nimble 5'11er who could sell a dummy to a brick wall, he was horrible to play against, keeping the ball guarded and out of the reach of championship defenders who found the nutmeg king a nightmare. Involved in a goal a week, he was often winning matches on his own and doing so with an effortless swagger. Spearheading QPR to promotion with their second ever title. to immortalise him as an icon of West London. Racking up a ridiculous 19 goals and 21 assists, he was honoured as Player of the Year, and the Premier League eagerly awaited the arrival of this maverick maestro. But yet again, as all was flowing in his favour, Tarapt couldn't help but paddle against the current. Publicising interest from PSG, he subordinated QPR, stating that he would only play for them if a deal wasn't agreed upon with Paris. Edel talks to everybody, doesn't he? Tells everybody what he what he's, who he's going to play for and Real Madrid and Barcelona. And... Whether rumour or reality, these comments were oddly timed, and when no move came about, things only worsened with the arrival of Joey Barton. The opinionated and hot-tempered scouser stole much of the attention from the midfielder, and when Warnock stripped him of the captaincy, giving it to Barton, tensions reached a boiling point. Couple that with the step up in opposition quality, the shaken seven endured a horrific drop in form, failing to find the back of the net from the first 10 matches, and having occasional outbursts when subbed off, which led to radio-based defamation from the lips of his skipper. From here, the rift between the pair grew, and Warnock became fed up with his antics, benching him for several mid-season matches. I just haven't got enough migraine tablets to, <laughs> to, to have you playing for me, Adele. As relegation loomed, Mark Hughes, who took over, reinstated the ex-skipper in a desperate effort to stay afloat, and in typical Tarabt style, he emerged as the hero, bagging the opener ahead of a man-of-the-match display in a triumph over Arsenal before then giving their rivals the same treatment in a 1-0 win to exact revenge on his old employers. He'd sat up at the right time to save his side from demotion by just one single point, rewarded with a three-year contract extension on which he inked his signature besides that of Harry Redknapp, QPR's latest attempt to evoke the spirit of championship to Rabt. He's a player that can do something special, so I'm looking to get the best out of him. Ultimately, it worked. Tarabt in his second appearance curled a beauty over West Ham's defence and then volleyed another five days later at the Hawthorns. With the Moroccan oozing class on a weekly basis, he was once again showing vital signs and in mid-December he put on his greatest show in the blue and white stripes. Brought in from the left to the number 10 spot, Redknapp gave him liberty in the midfield to harass Fulham's back line with direct running and dizzying dribbling. A brace at Loftus Road with a maestro showcase to boot, he'd slung the hoops on his back for their first three points of the year. Sanderland, brilliantly played by Tarant. Is it going to go alone? Oh, it's a fantastic goal! This was clearly his level more than fit for the top five leagues. However, the same couldn't be said for his team, who returned to the championship, clinching merely four wins all year. It was fair to say he'd done all he could with QPR, and now accustomed to both London and the Prem, he left a fan favourite, 
reuniting with Martin Yole at Fulham for a season-long loan. Lacklustre would be a generous way to sum up his stint with the Cottagers. Used sparingly and often out of position, it put the 24-year-old off English footy. And so, when, five months in, Clarence Seedorf offered him an escape route from Craven Cottage to the San Siro, he jumped. My agent called me and he said, Milan want you. <laughs> I'm in mean, Fulham, Milan want me? <laughs> okay, let's go. On paper, it sounds absurd. Yet this wasn't the Rossoneri of old, but one labouring in Serie A, resolute to resurrect their great institution, starting with a more ambitious transfer market policy. The Moroccan immediately took to life in Italy, and a debut goal inside eight minutes at Napoli's San Paolo suggested more was to come. A deal was able to shine in a team brimming with offensive talent, blending trickery with tenacity while adding another five goal contributions from the wing. Frailties in the 11's lower half cost them by May. And miles off the European spots, Pipo Inzaghi now believed they had one too many luxury players, giving the boot to the most recent of them. The loan spells were over, and back to London he went, despondent after yet another unsubstantiated dismissal. The club decided uh, to sack Seedorf and they bring in Zaghi, and Zaghi come with a different idea. And to be honest, uh, I lost, after that period of Milan, I lost one year because I could not understand how I didn't stay in Milan, you know? You got you know? the breast? You got the breast? I did, yes, at some point, yeah. Unmotivated, Tarabt returned to Redknapp a different man. And as the Englishman realized that he couldn't this time light the fire underneath him, publicized the reason behind the Moroccans' match day absences. No, he's not fit. He's not fit to play football. So I can't keep protecting people who don't want to run about and train and about three stone overweight. What am I supposed to keep saying? Keep, get, keep getting your 60, 70 grand a week and don't train. What do, you know, what's, what's the game coming to? An ugly tennis match ensued with the coach and his player trading blows via the media. While Redknapp claimed a deal was undisciplined and overweight, the Moroccan replied with pictures to prove otherwise before slinging out criticism of his own calling the Cockney a bad manager who's scapegoating him as an excuse for the results. Clashes with authority came in tandem with recurring injuries to reduce him to eight features across the nine months, by the end of which came the mutual termination of Tarab's contract with QPR. Spending merely hours as a free agent, another European mainstay came calling, though this time his talents would take him to Portugal. Benfica looked to coax some quality out of him, but arriving six pounds overweight, the Moroccan was again deemed unfit and played exclusively for the B team in the years most were hitting their prime. When it became clear he didn't care, Rui Costa and co couldn't be bothered and lent him to Genoa in the new year of 2017 to ply his trade in the division where he'd most recently found form. Sadly, this wasn't a Rossoneri repeat, as muscular fatigue and some toothless showings limited his time on the pitch to only six appearances in the initial campaign. Though into the second, we saw glimpses of the old Tarabt. Shedding the fat and starting nearly all matches in an advanced role, he was popping up with goals once again, strutting his stuff like his vintage self and from time to time exhibiting the Mr. Hyde side of his personality. By June, Benfica had begun to believe again and brought him back to Lisbon, where after another year in the reserves, he at last saw some Primera Liga minutes. In 2019, aged 30, we all saw him earn the fruits of his labour, established as a team sheet staple in a deeper midfield role, which demanded a defensive, more disciplined side to the Moroccans game. This was a matured new ideal with a better work-life balance and determined focus on making the last stage of his time in football a happy one. Averaging 40 appearances a year for three consecutive seasons as an eagle, Tarabt concluded his European journey on a high note at a club he still cherishes closest to his heart of all. I think the club that I, I get attached to the most with is Benfica, seven years. Amazing uh, club, uh, best academy, people so professional. People were saying that uh, when you arrive 26, 27, you slow down. And, and for me, it was the opposite. 
His farewell to the beautiful game has yet to wait, since from 2022 he's been the star of Al Nasser SC of the United Arab Emirates, able to combine his passion with his faith, aligning ever more with the Muslim beliefs that have influenced his entire career. Which is my favorite skill? Oh, brilliant. Not mix. I prefer. Is there a finish? There is! Brilliant! Surrounds! Players come and go in this sport, with most only around for two decades at best. So when a name is still chanted and printed on the backs of jerseys they haven't been seen in for years, they're clearly something special. Adil Tarabt is one of those people who gave onlookers such joy and awe in such a compact time span. Easily in the conversation for most entertaining championship player of all time, the Moroccan was blessed with outrageous talent and just as importantly, the nerve to show it off. Tied more than most to the phrase the streets won't forget, he was often mesmeric and occasionally orchestral possessing every natural physical trait needed to become one of the elite number 10s. That's just it though. All Tarab's problems came from North, stemming from his mind, which above all led him astray. An early believer in his own hype, he dabbled now and then in egomania, assured that quality over quantity would be enough to land him a spot in the squads of a Barcelona or Real Madrid and became bitter when these fantasies never came to fruition. More of a prima donna than Maradona, he was his own worst enemy, and though it all clicked up top later on, his peak had come and gone. Whether the tale of Tarabt is one of sorrow and regret is up for debate, but there's no arguing that we should have seen more. And if only you could Frankenstein his 30-year-old head on top of his 20-year-old body, we could be talking about a Premier League great. The most common reply was talented but frustrating. <laughs>